The following podcast is entirely a work of fan fiction. It is unofficial, unaffiliated, and unauthorised. Neither the podcast, nor any individual involved in its production, is now, nor has ever been, in any way associated with HBO, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, or the Song of Ice and Fire book series. The podcast was, is now, and shall always be entirely without profit. Neither the podcast directly, nor its makers indirectly, generate or receive any form of revenue or financial restitution that might otherwise accrue to the rightful copyright holders. The following podcast is entirely a work of fan fiction. We hope you enjoy it. Winterfell's yard is a hive of activity. The process of scavenging Winterfell for her stone is well underway, the guard hall already down to its foundations, and the kitchens not far behind. The salvaged stones are loaded onto carts and pulled by Dothraki-mounted horses through the gates to the cleared fields in front of Winterfell's northern walls. Making his way to the castle library, Tyrion has to weave his way through an obstacle course of men, horses, and piles of raw materials. Finding the entrance to the library blocked by a wagon, Tyrion rounds the building's corner and discovers an alternative means of access. The library's entire western wall has been removed, its interior exposed like a model maker's diorama. Stepping into the scene, Tyrion discovers Samuel Tarly overseeing the labours of half a dozen Stark guards, while simultaneously sorting books into separate piles, each pile taller and more precariously balanced than the last. He spots Gilly unloading books from an open crate and hurries over to interrupt and undo her efforts. Those need to be kept in the crates. The moisture in the air will damage their pages otherwise. It's too heavy, Sam. Here, give me that. Sam lifts the crate and hands it to an unimpressed Stark guard. Take these instead. Gilly accepts the modest stack of books Sam delivers to her arms, but she doesn't look best pleased as she exits. Love you. Tyrion watches as Sam harries his helpers, handing off piles of books to be carried out to the wagon parked haphazardly across the library's entrance. I wanted to make sure the books would survive, even if the library doesn't. It seems they're being well cared for. I had to beg Lady Sansa to let me have one of the wagons travelling to White Harbour. I still don't know how I'll ever decide which books to leave behind. Another Stark guard passes, carrying an enormous stack of books to the wagon. Wait, wait, hold on. Sam rushes over and takes the top book, flicks through its pages. I think maybe, yes, if I leave that one, then there's room for... He removes the book from the guard's stack, but quickly replaces it with three others. There, that should do it. Actually... Sorry. The unamused guard departs, and Sam returns to his sorting. Tyrion strolls through the stacks. I never took the Starks for an especially studious family, but I see now that I underestimated them. Last time I was here, I gave their library only a cursory look and decided that my time was better spent pursuing... Tyrion looks up and sees Sam's sweet, innocent face staring back at him. Other pleasures... I do recall there was a fire during last day. Between the fire and the Boltons, who knows what treasures we lost. We're missing most of R through T, I'm afraid. And there's definitely gaps in the map collection. I'm not sure I've actually ever heard anyone refer to books as treasures. What better word is there? 
what's more precious than knowledge? Of course, I'm not above a little fiction now and again. <laughs> Have you read Corianne Wilde's A Wanton's Tale? Oh, yes. Gilly had me read the whole series aloud to her. Now it's Sam's turn to stop himself, but he cannot halt his blushes. We're kindred spirits, you and I. All my life, books have been my most constant and faithful friends. My father forbade me from reading after a while. He said reading was for women and eunuchs. Real men spent their time hunting and fishing or fighting. I'd sneak books out of the library and read them by candlelight when everyone was asleep. My sister used to tease me and say that the only time I wasn't eating was when I was reading, because I was too scared I'd spill something and stay in the pages. Tyrion smiles and begins leafing at random through the books closest to hand. Have you discovered anything useful on our enemy? Dragonglass I got from a book in the Citadel. The Land of Always Winter was mentioned in half a dozen histories of the long night I found in the library at Castle Black. Anything that might save John and Daenerys a trip? I'm afraid not. There's a book I bought from a travelling merchant years ago that devoted whole chapters to the White Walkers. Tales of the Dead? Passages of the Dead? That was it. Maester Kennet, nothing but vague illusions and half-remembered rumour, I'm afraid. What about the Archmaester Harmon's Watchers on the Wall? I recall seeing a copy at Castle Black. Just a list of names and dates, really. Hard Home, an account of three years spent beyond the wall among... Among savages, raiders and wood witches. It was one of the first places I looked. After I read everything I could on the White Walkers and the Long Night, I started reading histories of the North, then of Westeros in general. Then I went back to the Long Night, but this time included more patchwork accounts, thinking there might be a kernel of truth in the details that occurred across the text. Lately, I've been working my way through anything at all to do with the fantastical or unexplained. Herman on a Shy by the Shadow, The Red Book, Annals of the Black Centaur, Vagoro's Ruined Cities, Stolen Gods... I thought I might finally have found something useful when I came across a moth-eating copy of Maester Vanyon's Against the Unnatural, but it turned out to be just a very misinformed and decidedly hateful screed against same-sex relations. A stark guard drops a book from the pile he is transporting. Careful! Ed, will you please tell them to be careful? Back in the shadowy recesses of the library, Ed's head pops up from among the pile of books like an especially miserable meerkat. When has anyone ever listened to me? Tyrion retrieves the fallen book from the ground and inspects its cover. The Lives of Four Kings by Grand Maester Caeth. Oh, that's one of my favourites. I once gave this as a wedding gift. I hope they appreciated it. Not particularly. Tyrion moves to another stack and runs his fingers over an open page and the dragon illustrated thereon. I must have read everything ever written about dragons. At the Citadel, I got to read the original Dragons, Worms and Wyverns. <laughs> no. Oh, yes. Written in Septon Bath's own hand. I say, read. I wasn't actually allowed in that part of the library. But I did see it once on a shelf, over someone's shoulder, before the door closed all the way. Ed staggers past, bearing a teetering stack of books. Bumping into the table, he knocks a dozen books, scattering to the ground, managing to drop his own stack in the process. For fuck's sake, Ed! Calm down. Don't know why you're getting so emotional about a bunch of old books. Sam hurries to gather up all the dropped books, replacing them in the arms of a bemused Ed as he goes. Can you not see, Ed? If we didn't have these books, everything inside them would be lost. All our history, our culture, all the stories that tie us together. Pages and pages of how people lived and who they loved and how. All the things that we write down so that they'd be here long after we're dead and buried. It would be like none of them, none of us, ever even existed. Can you really not see how important it is that we don't let that happen? Sam finally takes a breath and faces Ed, only to find his friend obscured behind the pile of books with which Sam has burdened him. Sam delicately places the last book on the top. I'll put these with the other done, shall I? Ed and his tower of books stagger away. Sam grins at Tyrion, embarrassed by his little outburst. Tyrion flicks through a smaller pile of books, set off to one side. His interest is piqued. What about these? Oh, those. They, that is to say, I, I borrowed those from the Citadel. I wasn't aware the Citadel allowed their books to be borrowed. All right, I stole them. I went to the Citadel hoping to learn something that could help us against the Night King, but instead I spent my days serving porridge in emptying chamber pots. 
only masters can access the really valuable materials. So I decided to expedite my studies. Flicking through the pages idly, half reading and half listening to Sam, Tyrion stops suddenly, then turns back a page. Is this High Valyrian? Hmm. I, I thought it might be. I don't speak a word, unfortunately. I only have a little, but I'm almost certain these words here translate as battle for the dawn, or perhaps battle for the light, or war for the light, maybe. Sounds promising. If only we knew someone with a head for languages. How can anyone speak 19 languages? You must have had a remarkable teacher. Standing at the window of Masande's modest room, Tyrion smiles at Sam's guileless wonder. Remarkable indeed. My master would stand over us with a whip as we drilled our irregular verbs. You'd be amazed how well you can retain information when given sufficient incentive. Miss Sande was sold into slavery as a child. She was serving as a translator in Astapor before joining our Queen's cause. Before our Queen liberated me from bondage. Tyrion nods in apology. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Then you have nothing for which to apologise. Unlike my former master, I believe only willful ignorance deserves censure, not ignorance innocently come by. Thank you. We hoped you might turn your talents to a particular passage in this book. Missande takes the book, scans the cover, checks the inside page. There's no title, no author. It's a diary of some kind, I think, perhaps belonging to a maester of the Citadel. In truth, we don't know where it came from originally, though the script looks high Valyrian. Not quite. It appears to be a variation, a regional dialect, perhaps, though not one I recognise. I certainly doubt the author was a maester. The grammar is atrocious, so they almost certainly possessed no formal education in the language. Can you translate? Inexactly, but I should be able to infer their meaning. Let's see. And so he shall come forth. A shadow. No. A darkness? A darkness over the world, born of an unnatural birth. Unnatural, as it's used here, could mean any number of things. Remarkable, supernatural, unexpected. It might even be more literal than that. Perhaps something strange or unusual in the weather. This I have seen, and he shall ride... It doesn't really make sense. Just a lot of abstractions and muddled syntax. Something about death riding the wind, but also death is the wind. From this same darkness shall come a warrior. A champion, maybe. So shall come a champion to... to destroy... to dispel... It, it's unclear. But essentially a champion will rise and defeat death. It says this champion will be born twice over and will come to be known as the Prince That Is Promised. The Prince That Is Promised? Where have I heard that before? On Dragonstone, from the Red Woman, Melisandre. She said there was a prophecy that this prince was foretold to hold back the long night and bring forth the dawn. I think this makes sense now. He shall come forth, death, riding death. That can only mean the Night King and Viserion. Born of an unnatural birth. The Night King wasn't born, not like you or I. He was created by the children of the forest. It doesn't get much more unnatural than that. And the champion, born twice over, can only be Daenerys. First to her mother, and then again when she emerged unburned from the flames that hatched her dragons. This is a book of prophecy. Daenerys is destined to defeat the Night King. But you said prince that was promised. Daenerys isn't a prince. There is no gender in High Valyrian. It could just as readily mean the princess that was promised. Very good, my lord. Does it tell us anything about how Daenerys will defeat the Night King? Not that I can see, no. If I could spend some time with it, perhaps I could discover more, but it will be a slow process. We have Bran searching through time, John and Daenerys searching north of the Wall, and now Missandei searching the scribblings of some long-dead anonymous seer. If we fail to discover the secret to defeating the Night King, certainly won't be through lack of trying. Thank you, Missandei. Tyrion follows Sam to the door. Lord Tyrion? 
might we speak a moment? Needle in hand, Aria circles yellow beetle. Grey Worm and a clutch of unsullied watch from a slight remove. Podrick and Brienne have halted Podrick's lessons and joined the audience. Yellow Beetle rushes at Arya, swinging his blade expertly. Yellow Beetle is soon on his back, needle at his throat. Arya lowers her sword and helps Yellow Beetle to his feet as he tags in Green Tick. Within seconds, he too is defeated. Aria slides Needle into her belt. I'll take Blue Rat, Blue Flea and Yellow Beetle. As you wish. And Green Cricket. He you cannot have. He's my most quick blade. That's why I want him. Pick another. I'll fight you for him. Spares and shields? Sword and dagger. Grey Worm glances at the eavesdropping Podrick and Brienne. Fine, you can have Green Cricket. Arya nods and walks away. Grey Worm catches Podrick's smirk. She is the sister of Jon Snow. My queen would not be pleased to see her harmed. A few feet away, Arya dispenses instructions to her chosen Unsullied. See again through the armory and he'll equip you with dragonglass weapons. Nothing that slows you down. Nothing you can't wear on your belt. The Unsullied move off towards the armory. Arya turns to find herself under close observation. You're Lady Greyjoy. I am. Do you really mean to say all the women and children to safety? If it comes to that. Just like Princess Nymeria, after the Rhine fell to Old Valyria. A great woman. A great warrior. A particular hero of mine. Mine too. They take a moment to size one another up. Yara nods at Needle. The Unsullied have quite the reputation. You must be half-warrior yourself. Have you ever been to sea? Once or twice. I'm always looking for good crew. It's a hard life, I won't lie, but there's plenty of room for advancement. Show me you deserve it, and you can be captain of your own ship before too long. I don't care about rank. The pay's not regular, but board the right ships and raid the right villages. You can make yourself a small fortune. I'm not interested in gold. What are you interested in? I want to see the world. I want to go places nobody has ever been before. I want... You want adventure? Arya simply nods. If you're still alive after all this, come find me. I'll give you your adventure. Arya's and Yara's attention is distracted by a commotion of bodies and excited chatter at Winterfell's gates. Is something happening? Come in. Tyrion pokes his head into Sansa's chambers. You're busy. I'll come back. Tyrion's head retreats from view. Tyrion! Tyrion's head reappears. Please, take a seat. Reluctantly, with the hesitancy of a truant summoned before the headmaster, Tyrion does as he's bid. It's rather a sensitive matter. It's about your family crypt. What about it? We're preparing to face an enemy capable of raising the dead. And we're building our defences on top of a graveyard. Yes, the thought had occurred to me. We cannot defeat the Night King's forces on two fronts. If he raises a second army to attack us in the rear while we're fighting at the first, we'll be overrun and the battle lost. I've allowed you to tear down half of Winterfell, but I draw the line at digging up my family's bones. I thought that might be your reaction, so I've prepared an alternative solution. Tyrion leads Sansa to the entrance of her family crypt. Several Dothraki busy themselves unloading stones from a cart hitched to a Dothraki mount, ready for the entrance to be sealed up. Maester Walken has kindly offered to oversee the project. If the Night King should raise your forebears from the grave, they won't have anyone but the rats to feed on. Thank you, Tyrion, for your consideration. Sansa looks to Tyrion but finds her own confusion reflected back at her. 
Daenerys stands at her window, though her gaze seems fixed on something far beyond the distant horizon. Her eyes carry heavy black bags, and she's still dressed in the robe she threw on the previous evening. Jorah sits by the fireplace, his face similarly showing the strain of a long, sleepless night. This can't be real. No less real than it was before the sun rose this morning. Walk me through it again. You're certain Sam was telling you the truth. Sam is an honest man, Khaleesi. Even if he weren't, I can think of no benefit to his lying to me. And who else knows about this? Again, Khaleesi. As far as I can tell, only John's brother Bran. Or rather, his cousin Bran, I suppose. But not John himself. Sam wanted my opinion on how you would react before he went to John. So Sansa doesn't know either? Not yet, Your Grace. But once John is told, I have to believe it's only a matter of time. Jorah stands and stretches with a grimace. We must leave this room, Khaleesi. You've already sent Missande away once. If you don't make an appearance soon, people will start asking why. If John really is Rhaegar's son, that would make him the true heir to the Iron Throne. It would mean that you're his aunt, and he your nephew. Daenerys almost physically waves this away. She paces the floor, deep in thought. Convene my council, but do it quietly. I don't want to raise any suspicions before I've had a chance to talk through our options. Our options, Your Grace. You have something more you wish to say? The last time I put love for a woman above my honour, I lost everything. You made the right choice in telling me. I swear to you, you will not lose a thing for remaining true to your queen. I think perhaps they already have. But what I saw yesterday... Every time two dragon riders went to war over the Iron Throne, the entire country burned. It would never come to that. John loves me. And you love John. I know. But the lure of power can do strange things to people. I said I would break my fast later, Miss Ande. Lord Varys, I said I wasn't to be disturbed under any circumstances. Forgive me, Your Grace, but I'm fairly certain you weren't accounting for this particular circumstance. Jamie Lannister stands in the centre of the Great Hall, still dressed in his dirtied riding clothes. He faces the Lord's table, behind which sits Daenerys, flanked on either side by Jon and Sansa. The Great Hall is standing room only. All of Winterfell wants to witness this. Am I on trial? We just need to ask you some questions, then we'll decide what's to be done with you. Not at all like a trial, then. You have your brother's sharp tongue, but not his instinct for self-preservation. If you're hoping I'll beg for my life, I'm afraid you don't really have the leverage. If I don't die on your order today, I die at the Night King's hand tomorrow. The hours between today and tomorrow can feel like forever, under the right circumstances. John and Sansa exchange a wary glance. Explain to me why you're here, Kingslayer. Jamie catches Brienne's eye, and she recognises the same anger she saw that day in the baths of Winterfell. By what right? From whom exactly did you learn about your father, the king I slayed? Viserys? The son who had his birthright stolen away? Barristan Selmy? A good man, yes, but one that held his own honour in high regard than he did the lives of those that suffered under your father's tyranny. Sycophants and servants looking to ingratiate themselves with a conqueror? Perhaps I'm the first man to ever tell it to you plainly. Aerys Targaryen was a cruel, sadistic monster. If you don't want to take my word for it, just ask around. Winterfell is a damn good place to start, actually. I do not need you to tell me what my father was, just as I don't need to hear you speak to know what you are. The sins of one man do not justify the sins of another. And yet here you are, contemplating murdering me for mine. Thugs and brutes commit murder. Sovereigns dispense justice. It's remarkable that you never met your father, yet you and he share such similar views on the world. What's your position on fire, I wonder? It has its uses. 
Perhaps you could try again to tell us why you're here, Sir Jamie. I've stared death in the eyes more than once in my life, but never quite so literally as that day in the dragon pit. Suddenly, fighting for an ugly iron chair didn't seem to make much sense. I decided I'd rather fight for the living. Have I come to the right place? John noticeably reacts to this echo of his own past, his presumption suddenly nudged a little off balance. The rest of the room, though, appears unimpressed. You'd have us believe that you're here as a humble soldier? What else? A spy. A sower of dissent. An assassin. Your Grace, would you permit me just a few moments to speak in Sir Jamie's defence? Daenerys eventually breaks her death stare at Jamie to give Brienne the nod. Jamie Lannister is known across the Seven Kingdoms as the Kingslayer, the man that cut down the king he was sworn to protect. In service to his sister, the woman that presently occupies the throne that by rights belongs to you, he has planned and executed a military opposition to your reclamation that has already caused pain and suffering beyond measure and brought about the utter destruction of at least one of the great houses of Westeros. His hands are forever stained with the blood of countless men, including men sworn to you, my lord, and to you, your grace. He is notoriously arrogant, self-satisfied, and dismissive of anyone he considers beneath him, which is just about everybody. I'm confused. Didn't you say you wanted to speak in his defence? A reasonable question. I say all this so you understand I am not blind to who Jamie Lannister truly is, but I see all of Jamie Lannister, which is why I also see the good in him. When he and I were taken prisoner by the Brotherhood, he defended my virtue when I was nothing to him but his captor, and he did so to the cost of his own sword hand. He defied his sister and his king to honour his word to Catelyn Stark, and even equipped me with a sword and armour, and squire I would need to defend her daughters and see them safely home to Winterfell. Everything he has done these past months, he has done out of loyalty to his house and love for his family. I don't know if any of this tips the skills that measure all our deeds towards his favour, or even if they do, whether it should count for anything to someone that suffered at his hand. But I do know it means he's not the monster you believe him to be. Jamie studies Brienne, obviously touched. All eyes turn to Daenerys. You would stake your own honour in support of this man? Without hesitation, Your Grace. If I may, Your Grace. After a moment's consideration, Daenerys nods her assent and Tyrion takes the floor. If my sister were going to send someone to assassinate you, do you really believe she would send Jamie? There are more than 100,000 men camped at Winterfell. Cersei could have hired any one of them, someone that was a complete stranger to you. But instead, she sends someone you know only as a mortal enemy. If you were the bloodthirsty conqueror Cersei believes you to be, rather than the benevolent queen we all know you truly are, wouldn't she assume you have Jamie butchered on sight, rather than give him a fair hearing? I don't know what your sister thinks, and evidently neither do you. I should have taken King's Landing and fed your sister to my dragons the day I first set foot in Westeros. But instead, I listened to my hand when he advised me to capture Casterly Rock. John can barely keep his eyes from rolling in exasperation. He thought this issue was resolved. Your Grace, And I... again, when he advised me to agree a temporary peace with his sister so that we might confront our greater enemy together. Yet there she sits on my Iron Throne, and here I sit with one solitary Lannister soldier. A one-handed soldier at that. I may not be the reinforcements you were hoping for, but I'm afraid I'm all you're getting. Cersei never had any intention of honouring your truce. Sansa alone looks entirely unmoved by this revelation. She has already taken steps to double the size of the Lannister army. As we speak, the Iron Fleet sails for King's Landing with the total strength of the Golden Company. Daenerys's jaw clenches, but she manages to restrain her fury. How unfortunate. I'm sorry. I know you need every sword you can get. Unfortunate for you. If I'm no longer bound by the terms of alliance with your sister, then there really is nothing preventing me from feeding you to my dragons. 
John steals another quick glance at Sansa, receives a raised eyebrow in return, then leans close to Daenerys. Grace, might I have a moment in private? Daenerys at first looks as though she will refuse him, but finally consents. We will reconvene presently. Please, talk amongst yourselves. Daenerys and John exit, John throwing a scowl at Sansa and the expression of grim satisfaction she wears, his sister clearly feeling herself vindicated in her aspersions upon Daenerys's character. Cersei sits upon the Iron Throne, Kyburn standing and Euron sitting on the steps below. A lean-faced old man, dressed in simple farmer's garb, presents his supplication before the throne. After they've taken the crops, they went house to house, stealing anything they could find. They said they'd be back soon as the next harvest were ready, and if we didn't have it ready for them, they'd burn the whole village down. And what did you do to stop them? Stop him, my lord? You've got pitchforks, don't you? Scythes for cropping? We're not soldiers, my lord. We're farmers. We don't know how to fight. We've never had to. It's always been the Lord's men that kept things in order. But since the Turrells are all gone... You believe it's now the Queen's responsibility to rid you of these bandits? Oh, no. Begging pardons, my lord. But they weren't bandits. They're men from Golden Grove. Farmers just like us. Farmers raided your village? They are not bad men, my lord. Just hungry and desperate. They gave half their stores to the war effort, same as us. But then the bandits come, proper bandits like. And now winter's here and it's too late to plant anything new. We was hoping that maybe the Queen's men the could... Queen's men are busy preparing themselves to defend the capital against an army of foreign savages and northern traitors. Do you believe the people of King's Landing are less deserving of my protection than your cabbage patch? No, oh, Your Grace. No, I should hope not. If you and your neighbours are not prepared to fight for your farms, then I don't see why my men should be expected to do it for you. You may leave. The farmer bows and trudges away disconsolately. How many more are waiting? Two hundred, Your Grace. Two hundred? Mm, it will take. It's only ever take. It seems to be the only thing these people know how to do, besides complain. I believe we have a servant of the Crown next, Your Grace. A collector of taxes arrived from Grassy Vale this morning. Do you mean some insult? Coming before your queen, looking like that? The tax collector cuts a pitiful figure. He has made a concentrated effort to clean away the tar and feathers, sacrificing irregular tufts of hair to the barber's shears and scrubbing his skin to an angry, abraded pink, but clumps of black pitch and grey chicken feathers still stick to his person. Forgive me, my lord. I tried my best to wash up, your grace. Truly, I did. I was going about the crown's business, same as always, when a mob of Lord Meadow's men dragged me off my horse and told me I was under arrest for disturbing the Queen's peace. How can you be breaking the Queen's peace when you're collecting the Queen's taxes? That's what I said, my lord. But they said it wasn't this Queen's peace I was disturbing. Go on. Uh, I'm not sure I should say, Your Grace. My good man. Your queen was giving you her leave. No harm shall come to you. They said you weren't the real queen. They said... They said you were guilty of adultery and incest and murder. That's enough. And that your children weren't King Robert's and that you had King Joffrey poisoned because he loved Queen Marjorie more and... I said, that's enough. They said Grassy Vale only recognizes one queen. And that's the Dragon Queen, Daenerys Targaryen. That's who'll be getting their taxes, they said. Kyburn and Euron wait for Cersei's anger to flare, but she simply studies the tax collector silently. Kyburn? Your Grace? 
Hurry and fetch that farmer back. At once, your grace. Do these cowards have anything to say about me? Uh, begging pardon, my lord, but who are you? You are in Greyjoy, king of the Iron Island. Oh, no, my lord. The farmer returns, his head bowed, expecting the worst. You and your neighbours will accompany this man to Grassy Vale, who will extract from the people there the taxes still outstanding, plus one tithe for late payment, and another as penalty for laying hands upon the Crown's representative. But your grace... Deliver to the Crown that which is its due, and your village shall have my leave to take from Grassy Vale's stores however much you deem necessary to adequately replenish your own. Truly inspired solution, your grace. Most economical. How are we supposed... As Lord Greyjoy has already established, you are not without the means of commanding your own circumstances. If you lack the requisite will, then your ill fortune is nobody's fault but your own. Nothing is handy to you in this life. You take what you want, or you learn to live without. On the Iron Island, where I am king, we would put it like this. Pay the iron price and fill your bellies, or don't, and start. It's a choice I've had to make many times before. Now look at me. Oh, the gods help those that help themselves, my friend. But, but your queen has spoken. You may leave. I believe I've had my fill of justice for one day. Send the rest away. Daenerys waits impatiently while John closes the door and pours them both a cup of wine. What are we doing here? John hands Daenerys her cup. She immediately sets it aside. I wanted to give you some time to think, away from everybody's attention. I'm perfectly capable of making a simple decision under pressure. I don't doubt it, but taking a man's life should never be a simple decision. You think I should spare him? Jamie Lannister, the Kingslayer. There's not a soul in the Seven Kingdoms that thinks he's a good man. And how many do you think would speak to your defence? It will take time for the people of Westeros to know me. Don't you see? They think they already do. And you're not going to convince them otherwise by solving all your problems from the back of a dragon. Daenerys takes up her cup and takes a long drink of wine. At the back of the room, among the press of bodies, Tormund leans over to Ed. I'll bet you twenty coppers she feeds him to her dragons. Make it forty, then you're on. Gendry, forced to overhear, turns to scold the pair. You can't bet on someone's life. The boy's right. He's a dead man for sure. You have to bet on how she kills him. It's not exactly what I meant, Clegane. With one eye on Grey Worm for any sign of objection, Tyrion approaches Jamie. What in the seven hells were you thinking? What do you suppose they're talking about in there? What did you possibly imagine would happen when you strolled up and presented yourself at the gates of Winterfell? Last time I was here, we were given a wonderful welcome. Standards have definitely slipped. Jamie. Cersei and I have had a parting of ways. She thought I should be executed for treason, while I was of a different opinion. It seems Cersei and Queen Daenerys share some common ground after all. Tyrion takes a step closer. Things could have gone better thus far, it's true, but all is not lost. Show yourself chastened and throw yourself upon the Queen's mercy. Daenerys is a fair and reasonable woman. Yes, those were exactly the words that came to mind as I watched her burn my men to ashes. We are at war, Jamie. You cannot blame her for doing it well. If we condemned people for the things they did in battle, then you'd be dead already, and half this room beside you. Please, Jamie. Not all that long ago, when I was in your position, you cancelled me to play along with my accusers, but I let my pride condemn me. Do better. Be the bigger man. Tyrion and Jaime share a wry smile, and Tyrion returns to his seat beside Varys. She brought up Casterly Rock again. I heard. And you're in Greyjoy's surprise attack. I heard that too. Now your sister has broken the truce that you brokered. 
Will that be the last we hear about it, I wonder? You made peace with one Lannister when you needed to. Why not this one now? Trusting Cersei was a mistake, and a good ruler doesn't repeat mistakes. They learn from them. You trust Tyrion? Is that a mistake? I've been wondering. Or have you not been hearing me? All of Winterfell just heard you. I might question his judgement, but I am loyal to those sworn to my service. If you keep shaming them publicly for their mistakes, it won't be your loyalty that's the problem. Tyrion would never betray me. For all his faults, Tyrion is not his brother. Aye, and Jaime isn't his sister, and you aren't your father. We're defined by the choices we make, not by the people we're related to. Daenerys visibly reacts to this, but not for the reason John infers. You don't actually think he's a changed man, do you? He might have fooled Lady Brienne, and of course his brother is going to vouch for him. I think he's a liar, and a murderer, and more than likely the father of his own sister's children. But I also think he's forgotten more about the art of war than the rest of us have ever known, and that he'll do what it takes to get what he wants, which right now happens to be the same thing that we want. What was it Brienne said? His hands are forever stained with the blood of countless men. You can't put your honour in the hands of a man like that and expect it to be returned without a stain. There's right and then there's wrong. That doesn't become less true just because the moment is more desperate. John sits down wearily, runs a hand over his face and through his hair. I keep thinking about something that Theon said back on Dragonstone. He told me that when we were children, I always seemed to know the right thing to do. But he was wrong. I don't always know what's right. Nobody can know that. And even if something is the right thing to do, that doesn't make it always the best decision. When Davos told me what the Red Woman did to the Princess Shireen, I wanted to take her red myself. And you regret not doing it? Every day since. But I also regret not finding a way to live with what she did. So we might have her and her red god beside us in this fight. Daenerys sits down beside Jon and places a hand on his knee. If I turn a blind eye to injustice because it's convenient today, tomorrow I'll have no reason not to do it again. And then again the day after that. And once I start down that road, there's only one possible destination. I'll end up in exactly the same place as every other king or queen that started out with the very best of intentions. A place of permanent grey where good gets nothing, and bad gets excused away. John springs to his feet, and Daenerys follows. If we don't defeat the Night King, then there is no tomorrow. Jamie Lannister alone is not going to win us this war. Maybe not, but if we don't make the most of every advantage, then we will lose it. If you can't compromise even this one time... This one time? Just my being here is a compromise. Fighting your cause ahead of my own is a compromise. Our cause is your cause. That man murdered my father. You have to put aside the wrongs he did to your family. Could you? You and I would be at war right now if I hadn't. I'm sorry that I lack your gentle heart. It's got nothing to do with having a gentle heart. But I suppose I'm just not as ready as you are to forgive the very worst among us. Perhaps you think that makes me less suited for rule than... Her mouth is already forming the first syllable, but Daenerys stops herself before uttering the last two words she was thinking, but in so doing seems to have presented the situation in a new light within her own mind. John watches her expectantly, waiting for her to finish. Instead, Daenerys sighs and walks over to the window. Looking out, she sees the banners of House Targaryen flying over Winterfell, the banners of House Stark flying below. Standing awkwardly before the Lord's table, Jaime catches Sansa's eye. Incredible as it seems, I don't believe you and I have ever been formally introduced. We sat at the same table in this very hall when King Robert visited Winterfell. Sansa looks at Tyrion, then at Brienne. And we do have a few friends in common. Their good character speaks to your own. I do believe Sir Jamie's a good man, my lady. Perhaps you could go and join them back there, then, and put in a good word. You are the Lady of Winterfell, after all. 
It is plain on Sansa's face that she is not amused by Jamie's allusion to her being excluded from John's and Daenerys's private conversation. Brienne scowls at Jamie. Though not a smart man, clearly. Jamie opens his mouth to reply, but whatever he was about to say catches in his throat. Wheeled in his chair to a space beside Sansa at the Lord's table, Bran meets Jamie's stare, but speaks not a word. Jamie can hold the moment only so long, before this sudden confrontation with the spectre of his past compels him to avert his eyes in shame. At the side of the room, Gilly scans the crowd. She turns to Sam beside her. Do you have one of these meetings every time someone new arrives at Winterfell? Before Sam can answer, the muttering of the crowd abates as John returns, alone. He stands at Daenerys's place at the table. Her Grace has reached her decision and asks that I make it known to you all. If we have any hope of defeating the Night King and his army, we will need all the men we can get. We don't have the luxury of only accepting the men that we want. Jamie breathes a sigh of relief. Tyrion does the same. Brienne allows herself a discreet smile. Two of my men will shadow you at all times, and you're not to carry so much as a butter knife until the moment of battle. Is that understood? Understood. And if I see you within ten foot of our queen, I'll kill you myself. I wouldn't worry, Lord Snow. I hardly think I'm her type. Jamie's smirk withers away as John brings his face just inches from Jamie's own. I'm not a man that wastes words saying things he doesn't mean, Lannister. Ask around. The preceding podcast was entirely a work of fan fiction. It was unofficial, unaffiliated, and unauthorised. Neither the podcast, nor any individual involved in its production, is now, nor has ever been, in any way associated with HBO, Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, or the Song of Ice and Fire book series. The podcast was, is now, and shall always be, entirely without profit. Neither the podcast directly, nor its makers indirectly, generate or receive any form of revenue or financial restitution that might otherwise accrue to the rightful copyright holders. The preceding podcast was entirely a work of fan fiction. We hope you enjoyed it.